All right, before we get into this, one thing I do want to say really quick is I am not a licensed attorney in the state of Texas or anywhere in the United States. So I do say take everything that I say in this video with a grain of salt and always consult with your attorney first. I am not an attorney. Please consult with attorneys. Thank you. Let's get into this. All right, so today I'm going to do something a little bit different. So I get a lot of people ask me all the time, how do you fill out a contract for wholesale real estate? So it gets really confusing. Uh, you know, which form do I use? How do I fill it out? And what do I need to do to make sure I'm protected uh, in the contract? Because it just, it's all so confusing. Uh, and now in real estate, you have different types of contracts depending on what state that you're in. So I'm in Texas, so we have a benefit because we have state promulgated forms, which the Texas Real Estate Commission or TREC provides for us, which are these long, you know, 10 page forms, with tons of legal vernacular that just confuses everybody. Uh, but we still have the benefit if we want, we could use a different form like a, you know, your two or three page contracts, which I'll be honest, I don't really recommend just because the TREC form is well heavily used. Uh, every title company knows how to work with them. They're very easy to work with. Uh, so I want to show you and kind of demystify a little bit about how these contracts are and maybe make it a little bit easier for you. Because if you're trying to get your first deal, a lot of people are like, I want to get my first deal, but I don't know how to fill out the contract. So let's go ahead and dive on in here and let me show you what you need to do with these contracts and kind of, again, demystify a lot of these problems. So let's go and hop into my computer and show you what we're looking at here. So I just pulled a, a random house off of the MLS. This, this is not a house that I'm looking to buy. Uh, maybe, I mean, this is new 20, 22 hours ago. I, I might actually put an offer in on this one, uh, but I just grabbed this off realtor.com. So this is public information. This is public, not private. Keep that in mind. I'm not giving private information here pulling this straight from just realtor.com. Anyone can see this information, right? This is a listed house. So again, I, I just came in here and I just see, okay, we got this house here. Kind of looks like it needs work. So it's kind of a perfect fit for what we're doing, right? We, shitty house, you know, crappy house. So just kind of looking at here, okay, we got property details, attention investors, cool, cool. Yeah, so th this is like a normal fit for something that we would probably be putting an offer in on. Now, this video is not going to go over how to pull comps or how to determine Mayo or offer price or anything like that. This is simply just to go over how to fill out the contract. If you do want to learn more about how to pull Mayo and how to determine your offer prices, I, ha I do have another video on that that I'll probably either put down below in the description or I might have as a link somewhere up here. So just kind of keep an eye out for that. If you want to learn more about how to comp and whatnot, this is purely back in. So again, we're just going to just throw out an offer price on this house. Uh, again, I'm not actually submitting this offer. This is just purely for educational purposes. All right. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to grab this address and I'm going to hop into our little friend prop stream after I grab that address. Now, the reason why I'm going to PropStream is because PropStream has all the details of the property, all the, the mortgage information. We can pull comps in here. If you don't already have PropStream, again, there will be a link down below for you to sign up for a, a, a seven day free trial. Uh, it, is a, it is an affiliate link. So if you want to help support this channel a little bit, feel free to sign up through that link there below. I get a little bit of a kickback, nothing too crazy, but it does help support these uh, tutorials that I'm putting out here for you guys. But this is the software I literally use every single day in my business. I am a licensed realtor here in the state of Texas, so I have MLS access if I want, but I still prefer to use PropStream to pull all of my comps and property information just because it's one portal it makes life a lot easier. So again, so go here and enter in the address pull up the property now this is a new listed property so one caveat with prop stream it's not up to the minute with mls data like the actual mls will you cannot get better data than the actual mls i'm going to say that right now 
big advocate of this program, but they are still a third party data provider. So their data will be lagging behind a little bit uh, compared to uh, the actual MLS itself. So don't worry about it that you don't see the MLS details on here because it's just not updated. Always verify. All right, perfect. So the reason why I'm pulling this up is because there's certain information we need from here, from the tax records. Now you can either pull it up in PropStream or the tax records. Up to you. This just makes life easier. So again, I'm just going to see here what the legal description is, the lot, the block, the subdivision. Uh, looks like this is in an HOA. So that is nice to know because we may have to also submit in an HOA document as well with this offer. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to go ahead and we're going to send in an offer on this property. So what I'm going to do is I have all of uh, my contracts and forms loaded up as templates in DocuSign. That just makes my life easier when filling out contracts. You don't have to do this. Uh, you could very easily just download the forms from the TREC website and fill them in because they're already set up as fillable forms. So you can just fill them in from the TREC website. If you don't know how to get that here in, in Texas, just do a Google search for TREC documents. And the first thing that comes up here is contracts from TREC. And you just go here and download the contract. Now in Texas for single family homes or even multifamily homes or just the real estate general contract, they have the one to four family residential contract that covers any property that is one to four doors. So like a single family home to a quadplex, that's pretty much going to cover you for most everything you need, uh, other than like raw land, uh, for that, they have the un unimproved contract. I'll do another video on that another day. For the most part, I only ever use a one to four and no one ever bats an eye. So as long as you learn this contract, you're pretty much good to go. But you can easily just go in here and download this contract and it's entirely fillable on your computer. So I can just go into here and just start filling out all the details, save it, download it and send it. You don't need special software. I just have it loaded up here in DocuSign because it allows me to quickly fill it out, sign it, send it for more signatures if need be. It has everything already pre-canned and everything kind of fitting for what I need in my business. So the first paragraph here is going to be parties. That's going to be the people part of the transaction. You get the seller and the buyer. Don't need to go too much in depth there, right? So for the seller, the first part, this is who are we buying the house from, right? So if it's the actual homeowner who owns the house right now, well, we need to put their name or their company entity name into that field. Maybe you're buying this from another wholesaler, maybe, or it's from an investor. Maybe they're under contract to buy it. They're going to buy that property and then they're going to sell it to you. You need to put in the name of whoever you're buying it from, right? So you got to keep that in mind. So in my case, we're looking to buy this from the seller. Now in past, I've always just put owner of record and that normally covers me just fine. How companies are getting a little bit more picky about that. So we are needing to really go in and pull in the actual seller's name. If it's not correct from the tax records, the agent or the seller may let us know that. So we just got to keep that updated. So I normally, again, I'll just go here to prop stream and right here under property details, ownership info, it gives us this company entity. So this property is currently owned by a company. It's owned by some kind of entity. Uh, so it's an investor, right? Most likely. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually go here under mortgage and transaction his history. And I could see when they bought that house. So this company actually bought the house in 2021 for cash from the Davidson Family Limited Partnership. So it may have just been a transference or it could have actually been an actual purchase but they've owned this for a little bit. So they're not just flipping it. Uh, they probably bought it as a rental and now it's ready to be done with it. So let's take a look at that guy here. But yeah, that's our entity that we're buying it from. So we're just gonna change where it says owner of record to that entity name. Now this line is gonna be buyer, right? It says right here, this name as seller and this name as buyer. Now, if you're buying it, yourself 
Uh, you could either just put your name in here if you want. That's totally up to you because you're the one buying it. Or if you do have an LLC or a DBA or some kind of entity set up for your buying and wholesaling, you're going to put that into this line right here. Now, the next part is going to be what is entirely necessary if you're looking to do assignment of contract. So if you're looking to wholesale a property utilizing an assignment of contract, you do have to put in here and or assign. Now, the reason why this is so controversy is because in the state of Texas, all contracts are assignable unless stated otherwise. So that's the general rule. Where that falls short is title company by title company. Each title company will read it differently. They'll say, hey, if it doesn't say and or assigned, you can't assign it. Like they're, they're pretty strict about that. So most title companies require you to have and or assigned on the contract. Now, again, it could be argued. You may get some people, you know, lashing back at you saying, hey, no, look, if it has and or assigned, we're not doing that. I'll get into another video at another time talking about how to get around that, how to work with the seller to let them know why you need to have and or assigned on there. And we'll, again, talk about that a little bit deeper. But for the case of this video, if you're looking to assign the contract, you need to put and or assigned. And if you're in Texas and some of the states that are kind of changing some policies, there is a new disclosure you'd have to put into your contract effective January 1st, 2024. So depending on when you're watching this, this may already be in effect or it will be coming. So we're just going to start doing that now, just so you have that awareness. And we'll get to that here in a second. All right, now under property details. And this is why it's important that we have PropStream open. Because back here in PropStream, under property details, we need the lot, the block, and the subdivision name. Now, it may be laid out like this, nice and clean and crisp, like it should be. Sometimes it's not. But you can always extract the information from the legal description. So if you look here at the legal description, you'll see it says Carver Heights and the subdivision is Carver Heights. So the legal description kind of combines the lot, block, and subdivision, and kind of all puts it together. It gets really muddy when you're dealing with rural properties. Properties are outside of the city limits or vacant land. It gets really crazy to read these, but once you do enough of these, you start to kind of see it. But so right here we have lot 35, block 26, and Carver Heights. So we're just going to put that right in here, lot 36, uh, block, I think I have this right, oh, lot 35, lot 35, okay, now this is in the city of Fort Worth. Now, county, how do you know it's which county it is? Well, if you live in that county, you probably already know. But if you don't know, it's always best to verify because a lot of these cities sometimes will, spawn, will sprawl into other counties. Like Fort Worth it could actually be part of two different counties or three different counties, depending on where it kind of draws itself into. So you do always want to verify which county this house is in. So again, we can find that here in PropStream right up here, County Tarrant. So again, always better to verify than guess. And so we're gonna put that here in County. All right, now we're just gonna grab the full property address. And you see, I'm going back and forth to props from so much because it has everything we need. All right, so now we have the basics of the property details, the legal description, the county, city, and the address we have the seller's name and the buyer's name already lined up. We're most of the way there. I mean, the rest of the stuff becomes a lot easier from here. So the next part is going to be scrolling down here. We have, you know, a lot of this you, you can see, we can't change any of this text, right? All this text is, is, is can, it's called a promulgated form, meaning a lot of it is just legal vernacular, just put into there to protect the seller and the buyer. None of it has any real applicableness 
unless you see these check boxes, right? Nothing matters, truthfully, like it just stays in place unless it's checked off. So that's something to keep in mind. So like improvements, accessories, exclusions, Exclusions are going to be like if they're selling the house to you, but they're going to take the refrigerator or they're going to sell the house to you, but they're going to take the dryer, right? They're taking something off of the property that you would think normally would be a part of the sale. Now, we always put in here that we're buying the house as is. So we're just basically taking the house as it sits. I personally don't care if they take the refrigerator. I don't care if they take the dishwasher. I don't care. I'm expecting them not to be there anyway. But you can put them in here saying that they are going to take the back shed in the backyard. That's happened. That actually happens quite often where they will demolish a shed or they'll remove a shed or something from the backyard and they want to make sure that's included in the contract. So again, exclusions is just what it sounds like. They're excluding this part of the property from the contract. All right, sales price. So we make all cash offers, right? So we only have to worry about section A, which is cash, because we are making a cash offer to the property. So the entire purchase price is going to be cash. Now, if you're using any kind of financing, uh, say you're, you're getting a conventional loan or an FHA loan, uh, and actually even now in Texas, they made it to where even if you use hard money financing, if it's some kind of loan, you still have to state it as a loan. So this is going to be the cash portion, the amount of actual cash that you're going to wire out of your bank account or take a cashier's check from your bank account. How much is cash in this transaction and then how much is going to be carried over by the loan. So you have to kind of just pick that. So again, I'm going to make a full cash offer. So let's see, this house is asking 142 just for hoops and giggles. I am going to just do $75,000. Again, I have not comped this house. I don't know a real Mayo. I'm just throwing a number out there. Okay, so that's the cash portion. Now, B, which is going to be financing, I'm not going to do any financing. So again, I'm not going to check any of these boxes. I'm not assuming a mortgage. I'm not doing any seller financing. I'm not getting third-party financing. So I'm going to leave that blank. C is going to be the total amount of the purchase price. So that's going to be A and B combined. So since there was nothing in B, I'm just going to mimic what's in A. But let's say for a moment I was going to use hard money on this transaction. Well, I would put up whatever the hard money would normally require me to put up. Let's call that 7,000. Just throwing a number out there. It's probably higher than that. But let's say 7,000. I put that into A. And then the remaining imbalance of let's see, 68,000 would be in B if I were to use hard money, just to kind of throw things out there. I'm not, but that's all we got to do there. Leases. So this is uh, pertaining to any existing leases on the property. So let's say you're buying the house and there's a tenant in the property. We need to know what the lease situation is like. Now, if this house is vacant, there's no leases, you can ignore this portion. But let's say for a, a let's say in this case, there's a, a tenant that's still in the house, they have a year left on their lease. Uh, we need to have those lease documents. So what I would actually do is you just check this box right here that says residential leases, or maybe they have a fixture lease, or they have natural resource leases, like natural gas leases, or they have oil leases or gas leases, or they have something that Part of the property is leased by another entity or another person. Whatever those leases are, we need to have those documents. So we would check whichever of these boxes applies. Most of the time, since we're dealing with residential houses, the only leases that really only ever apply are going to be the residential leases. That's not to say you will run into a case where you have a different type of lease, but depending on whatever lease there is, you need to check this box. Now, if there is a tenant in the property, checking this box is not the only thing you have to do. There is another addendum on the TREC website and under contract addenda and scroll down here a little bit. Addendum regarding residential leases. So that seems this is where the TREC website is so nice. It has everything you need in one place, right? So if you need an addendum, you need a contract, it's right here. 
and they're perfectly approved by the Texas Real Estate Commission. So they're not going to have someone going, oh, you're using a weird improper form, right? You can't argue at these forms. It, it just makes life so much cleaner, so much easier. You don't need to worry about it, right? But you'd have to download that addendum and attach that to your contract if there's someone still living in the house after you purchased it, any kind of tenant or you know, leasee, if you want to call it that way. Same thing here for if there's a fixture lease or if there's a natural gas lease or whatever, you just download that, fill it out and attach it. We'll get into more of those videos later on. All right, so in this case, uh, let's just double check here. Attention investors, contractors, great opportunity. All right, so this is vacant. There's no tenants in this property, so it's perfect. So we're gonna actually just for the sake of this video, uncheck that. We will do more videos later on going over these addendums, but just keep that in mind. All right, so there's no leases, so we can avoid the rest of this. And you would right here just sign off or initial on each page. All right, now at the top of every page of the contract, you will put the address of the property. So there will be a field at the top of each of these for you to put the address of the house. Make sure you do that. Now, earnest money and option termination. Now, this is a big one that gets ignored and overlooked so much, right? In order for a contract to be effective, you have to have what's called consideration. Now, consideration for the most part is money, right? We all think of everything in money and dollar bills, right? Well, you could actually put anything for consideration, right? So I've seen some people in here, and I don't recommend this, but I've seen people in here do, you know, love and care in the earnest consideration, right? <laughs> so it's really weird. Now, I don't do any of that. It's always money. It's always a financial tran transaction when we're buying houses, right? So I, my boilerplate, I put $500. Now this could be debated. So many people are like, $500 is way too low. $500 is way too high. Like everyone's just like, has a weird perception to it. Now, real estate agents that have a general, you know, um, convention. There's no rule. There's no hard and fast rule of how much earnest money you have to put up for a house but real estate agents have a general convention of 1% of the purchase price, right? So whatever the purchase price is, 1%, that's your earnest money. Now the earnest money all gets applied to the purchase price. So it's not like it's additional money. It's not like you're saying, well, I'm buying this for 75,000, spending $500 in earnest money. So now my purchase price is 75,500. That's not the case. It's I'm putting $500 in earnest money that comes off of my 75,000. So after I put this money up, when I come to closing, I'm gonna be credited my earnest money and my option money. Both of those are going to be credited to me on the closing statement at closing. So I get that money back no matter what. And if you're assigning this property to your end buyer, you get that money back to you every time at closing. So just keep that in mind. You're not losing this money unless you forfeit the contract or you default the contract outside of your inspection period. So then you do forfeit that money. So you wanna be careful with it. So I'll put $500 just kind of as a base boilerplate. Sometimes I'll increase it if the price of the property is higher or if we negotiate a higher term. But I'll normally just put like $500 in there. You can go lower if you want. I've seen, seen and done $100 earnest money often so i've done that but i would always put a little bit higher in there i don't want to go too high and again we'll go into that in another topic as far as uh negotiations and whatnot but i never want to go too too high to leave a little bit of room there uh as my earnest money and five, fifty dollars as option money now what's the difference between earnest and option money Earnest money is saying, hey, look, I am serious about this. I'm letting you know if I default on this contract or I back out outside of my option period, I am forfeiting this money. So if I don't perform, you at least get my earnest money deposit. But the earnest money is refundable during your inspection period. So if you go and do your inspections and you find out you can't move forward and you have to terminate your contract, within your option window or your inspection window, 
you get that earnest money back, right? That money comes back to you. Now the option money, that is non-refundable. The option money, this is money that you are paying the seller to give you the right or the ability to inspect the property, right? So I'm saying, hey, look, I'm gonna put 50 bucks up to get five or 10 days to inspect the house. So you, you don't get that money back if you terminate the contract. Now you get it back to you if you close. If you go to the closing, you do get that money back to you if the house closes. But you do forfeit that money um, no matter what, pretty much. Just, it's gone. Let's just put it that way. It's gone. But let's just, all you're saying is, hey, look, I'm going to give you this money to pay for the days for me to inspect this house. Again, my general rule, I keep it as low as possible. Some people want a higher amount. Again, there's no hard and fast rule. There's no general convention of how much you're supposed to pay for option money. Uh, I've had some sellers ask for a ridiculous amount in option money, like $500 in option money, $1,000 in option money. I'm like, no, I'm not paying you that much for five, 10 days to inspect the house. I pay 50 bucks generally. Um, some people will say it's 10 bucks a day. Other people will say it's 100 bucks a day. There's no real rule to it. So again, I keep it low, give them the ability to negotiate upward. I don't like paying over 150 bucks, generally. If I feel like it's a good deal and I can sell it no matter what, I may go a little higher. All right, now I did skip over one line here, which is uh, the title company. So this is gonna be who is gonna be closing on the deal. Who is the escrow officer that's gonna be handling the closing? So we use Fidelity National title up here in Flower Mound. Great crew, they know what they're doing. They're really easy to work with. Uh, if you need a good title company, I would reach out to them for sure. They can help you out. But you just put in uh, the title company info here, as well as the address of where that's gonna be. Now, the earnest money and option money get delivered to the title company. They hold on to that money and disperse it. Never give the seller money. Just keep that in mind. Never pay earnest money to the seller, even if they demand it. If the seller says, no, you pay the earnest money to me, no. No money leaves your hands to the seller. Keep that in mind. Never, ever do that. It always gets held with a third-party escrow company or title company. In the past, we would pay the option money to the seller. That's been changed within the recent years where we can now deliver that to the title company and it's made life so much easier. I send one wire to the title company for earnest and option. They hold it, it's good to go. Don't ever give money to the seller. All right, now this is uh, the other negotiating stream points where if uh, you were to deliver additional earnest money later on in the contract. I normally never do. You know, pretty much we deliver our earnest money at the beginning of the contract. You do have three business days from when this contract is executed to deliver that money. That's just straight up. You have three days to do that. I would never recommend you deliver earnest money before you contract. Uh, you'll get some sellers that will ask you to do that. I don't recommend doing that because if you deliver earnest money and there's no contract then it can be conflicted of who really has ownership to that money if the seller never signs the contract so wait until the contract's signed but like i said number one here buyer shall deliver additional earnest money i've done this in the past where let's say we're trying to get to the contract and we're saying hey look you know we'll pay 500 dollars up front for the earnest money and then within 10 days uh, of our contract or when our option period expires, we will deliver more option or more earnest money. Sometimes we'll do that to get the contract because basically what will happen if, hey, look, I'll put $500 up now and then after 10 days, we'll put another $1,000 up. So it's less money out of my pocket up front. But by that time in my option period, I should know, am I gonna close on this myself? or do I have a buyer lined up? So pretty much at that point, we're certain we're closing on it. Nine times out of 10, I never fill this out. It's only been a couple of times we've actually ever had to do that. But if you make that agreement, it would just go right here in number one. And again, the rest here, nothing applies. Basically all it's saying is, you know, the option earnest money are due within three business days of contract execution. 
and basically saying, you know, if it you know, falls on a holiday, it extends a day. If it falls on a Sunday, it extends a day. It's business days, right? So if you execute on a Friday, you have until Tuesday, maybe even Wednesday, to deliver your earnest and option money to title. That's all it's telling you right there. It's all a matter of counting business days. Okay. And the buyer authorizes the escrow agent to release and deliver uh, option fee to seller at any time without any further notice or consent from the buyer. Because again, the option money goes to the seller no matter what. Termination option. So this is the big one right here. If you're wholesaling, you need the termination option period. This is your period to back out of the contract for any reason whatsoever. So if you uh, are contracting the house and you're now trying to market the property or trying to bring in your buyer, or even you're just buying the property yourself and you're doing your inspections, your termination option period gives you that amount of days. And these are calendar days. These are not business days. These are calendar days from the day of execution. And it is effective until 5 p.m. on the last day of option. So like today, we have a house that we're in a contract on. So we have until 5 o'clock today, because this day is our last day of option. I have until 5 p.m. today, local time, to terminate that property or let them know that we're moving forward. If it gets to 501 and I tell them at 501, hey, we're backing out on this contract, I now lose my earnest money. Simple. So just keep that in mind. Set a lot, set reminders, set alarms, anything you got to do on that end. Now, right here, I put 10 days as a default. You can put as many days as you want. I've seen some people put 30, 60 days. I don't recommend that. Holding the seller over the coals for that long to where they can't sell to anyone else for that, that amount of time, that's putting the seller at a disservice. I would never recommend putting that many option days in your contract. I kind of cap out 10, 15 days. I don't like going that long. Most of the time, if the property doesn't sell within five days, it's pretty much a dud anyway. So 10 days is kind of my maximum. Now, failure to deliver the earnest money or option money within a timely manner. Now, this is a big one. And I have been, I've fallen prey to this myself. So keep an eye on this. You have three business days to deliver earnest and option money. If you don't deliver the earnest and option money within those three days, you forfeit your earnest money. You forfeit your right to have an option period. And that's what uh, paragraph C and D are telling you. You have to deliver this money within this time period or you forfeit that right to keep that money or to have the option period. So keep that in mind. All right, title policy and survey. Now, title policy, this is something, this is basically how title companies make money, is by selling title insurance or title policies. So if you ever hear that, you know, what, what's the title policy, what's the title insurance? That's what they're saying right here, is they're talking about an insurance policy that normally the seller pays for. This is the, a typical thing. The seller normally pays for the title policy because basically it's a, securing the title of the property from the day that we buy it all the way into the past. So if something came up on title afterwards that maybe was missed by the title company or maybe some claimant came up, you could file a claim on the title insurance to cover yourself and the money you paid to buy this property that covers you so you don't lose the property, you don't lose any money, essentially. So it, it's a good thing to have. But since we are investors and we negotiate to say we pay all the closing costs, we're paying for that. So the title policy is going to be drawn, again, by the title company that you're using to close on the property. So I just mirror and match that. You don't need to worry too much about this. Your buyer pays for it no matter what. All right. Uh, right here, uh, this is basically saying that if any of these things come back on the title report, basically saying that the title report will not be amended or the title policy will not be amended, essentially. And then right here, I'll basically say if they are to be amended, who will pay for those amendments, the buyer or the seller? Again, we're not asking for it to be amended. We're just gonna leave it as is. And again, you just sign off here on the bottom. So again, all parties at the sign, I should have mentioned this earlier, but all parties have to sign. So if you uh, if you have more than one partner or more than one signer in your business, 
you both have to sign on here. Initial on every page and sign on the last. Uh, all sellers, right? Most of the time you only have one seller you're dealing with, so only one seller signs off. But maybe you have a, a husband and a wife. They both have to sign off on here. Or maybe it's an airship situation where you have a brother, a sister, aunt, uncle, a whole bunch of people. Everybody has to sign on the contract. They have to initial on every page. They have to initial on any changes that are made to the contract and sign on the contract or it's not an effective contract. Keep that in mind. All right, next page. Again, top of the page, you gotta make sure you put the address in there at the top. All right, survey. Now, for the most part, I never order a survey. Totally up to you if you wanna order a survey. I always ask the seller, do you have a survey that you wanna convey or you wanna provide to us? Not required, but if you have one, we'd love to take a look at it. I leave this up to my buyer. If my buyer wants to buy a survey, that's totally up to them. If you're the buyer and you wanna order a survey, you put that right in here. Again, I don't buy really anything. I just wholesale all these properties. So for me, I don't order a survey. So I leave all these unchecked. Cause like I said before, anything that's on here that is not checked doesn't apply. It only applies if it's checked. So keep that in mind. So I leave all these unchecked and I just put NA in there that way, just let them know I don't care. I'm not buying a title policy. All right, objections. Now, objections are going to be. This is another wheel out, Paul. Another wheel out clause that you can utilize in your contract. Now, it doesn't apply too much because I have my option period. With the option period, I can back out no matter what. But the objections help me out here. Where let's say we get past our option period, and title hasn't come back with the title report yet or the neighborhood uh, documents or whatever comes back. Let's say those all come back and inside of there, it says that in this neighborhood, I can't rent properties, right? Or in this neighborhood, I can't have any kind of certain rule or whatever. I could put into here, well, if it doesn't allow residential leasing, maybe it only allows commercial leasing or maybe it only allows people who are residents or owners of the property to live in the house, right? So let's say that comes back and I'm outside of my option period and it says I can only owners can live in the house, not renters. I have three days after receiving that notice to back out of the contract for, for whatever reason, for that reason right there, I can still back out of the contract because it came back on paragraph D as an exception. Most houses we deal with don't have that problem, but that does come up from time to time. So I do, I do have that in there. But again, most of the time, title reports come back within our option period window, so it doesn't apply too much. I think this is another, another reason to get out of the contract. All right. <clears throat> right here, title notices, uh, abstract title policy, et cetera, and so forth. Again, these things you can't change. So I don't put any focus on them, right? I just don't, because I can't change them. All right, membership, ownership. So this is where it's talking about HOAs or homeowners associations, right? So right here, this is where I say, is the property in a homeowners association or is it not in a homeowners association? So according to PropStream, it is in an HOA. Now, I always like to revert back to what it shows on the MLS listing because most people don't have access to stuff like PropStream that tells us this information. So if I look on here, this says nothing about an HOA at all. Now, if you're on the MLS, it could tell you that, uh, but I can just scroll through here and see, okay, is there an HOA? I'll be honest with you, it's not a huge deal if you forget this part. It, it, People want to make it out to be, but it's really not that big of a deal if you forget this part. Because if I send this contract to an agent, that realtor would be like, oh, hey, this is also an HOA. We need this addendum. They'll normally fill it out and send it over to you. So again, I don't put a lot of stress in on this, but if I do see it's in an HOA, I will fill that out. Now, this does not tell me anything about there being an HOA. So if I was to fill this out based on what I see on realtor.com, I would just say it's not in an HOA, right? But if it is in an HOA, you just check this box right here that says the property is 
uh, is not subject. Oh. Is subject, that's right, I was reading this wrong. <laughs> is subject to mandatory uh, membership of a homeowners association. So if I check this box saying that it is, again, I just go here and I download this form, addendum for property subject to mandatory membership and a property owners association. I would download this form, I'd fill it out and attach it to my contract. In this case here, I'm going to check that it is not, because I don't know that it is without someone telling me. And again, the rest of this, I can't change. Tax, statutory taxation districts, watertight districts, I can't change any of this stuff, right? Uh, required notices here under the taxation districts and whatnot. This is if the property is in like a mud or a pud, you know, it, any kind of different um, taxation district. Again, I don't know this if it's not stated. So right here, if I look at the property description that I'm given by the realtor, it doesn't tell me anything about there being a different type of taxation district. So I don't know if it is in one or not. So I, I won't know these kind of things. But if it, if it notices here, it notes it here that it is, then you just have to put it here that the property is in a mud district or whatever it is. Okay, property condition. So this is where we're going to basically say that we're buying the property as is. We don't care about the condition. We're buying it the way that it sits. We're not going to ask the seller to make any changes. But again, this gives us some ability to add a couple more back out clauses or a couple more weasel out clauses, as some people will call it. So the first one is going to be the seller's disclosure. Now, if I'm buying this property from a direct to seller, they're most likely not going to have a seller's disclosure on hand ready to go. But if we're buying this from the MLS, the real estate agent, if they did their job properly, should have had the seller fill out a seller's disclosure notice and attach it to the MLS listing. Now, again, the problem with looking at realtor.com and not having MLS access, this doesn't tell me if there is a seller's disclosure. So I'm going to request one. I'm going to request that they send me a seller's disclosure. And I'm going to give them five days to do that. If they don't send me the, if they don't send me the seller's disclosure, within five days of the, effectiveness of, uh, of the effectiveness of this contract, I can back out of the contract, right? So a couple little ways to work with these things, right? So now if you're buying this from the MLS and you're actually using the multiple listing service, there is a documents section in the MLS for each listing where you can get additional documents that the real estate agent may have uploaded about this property. So that's something to look at as well, because maybe that document is there on the MLS. But in this case, we're not using the MLS. So I, again, right here, I check this box saying that I have not received the seller disclosure and I'm going to give them five days. Now, if they did provide the seller disclosure, said they sent it to you already or it was on the MLS for you to download, you do have to check this box that says buyer has received the notice. You have to download that seller disclosure sign off on it and attach it to your offer. In this case, they did not send it to me, so I'm not going to use it. Now, this last one, number three, where it says seller is not required to furnish the notice under Texas property code. Right here, under Texas property code. That's all it says. Now, I get a lot of sellers who own the property. They live in the property, but yet they'll say, hey, I'm not required to furnish the seller's disclosure. They're wrong. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, they are wrong. The Texas Property Code is pretty strict on who is not required to facilitate a seller's disclosure. Now, all they're basically saying is the seller's disclosure is only re not not required in like um, a foreclosure sale or auction sale situation, a probate sale situation, where say your mother died and she gave you the property in her will and now you're selling it. In those cases, okay, in inheritance, you don't have to provide one. I personally don't care about the seller's disclosure. I don't. If you look at the seller's disclosure, there's boxes on there that says, basically has all the items that say, you know, hot water heater, furnace, is there gas? 
And it says, yes, no, unknown. Most sellers we deal with fill out unknown. They don't know. They don't know anything about the property. I don't care what's on that seller's disclosure. And I even tell them that. I don't care what's on the seller's disclosure. I, the only thing you cannot do is you cannot give them advice of how to fill it out, right? You, you simply can't. You say, hey, just fill this out to the best of your knowledge. If you're not aware of anything, you're more than okay to put unknown, right? And you make that disclosure known that you cannot guide them or give them advice on how to fill this out. So, but again, number three, you get a lot of people say, hey, I'm not required to furnish it when they really are. And I would refer them to the Texas Property Code about the seller's disclosure notice just to refresh them up about it. Now, right here, seller's disclosure of lead-based paint. Now, if the property is built before 1978, and I use this right here, if it was built before 1978, you need to include the lead-based paint disclosure, which I actually have on this contract because I believe this house was built in 1959. So again, most of the houses we deal with were built before 1978 because that's like the prime wholesale type of property. So since this was built before 1978, we'd have to include the lead-based paint disclosure. Again, back on the TREG website, you'll find it right here. Addendum for seller disclosure information on lead-based paint and lead-based or lead-based paint hazards as required by federal law. Download that, attach it to your contract, fill it out, sign it, done. Are you are you seeing kind of a commonality here? I am. <laughs> okay, so again, we do have to include that on our contract. If you get confused by this and I'm going a little too fast, I'm sorry. Feel free to go ahead and rewind, rewatch, and go back over some of these things, or shoot me a comment down below and we'll talk about it. All right, down here on the next page, we have buyer accepts property as is. I don't ever change this because this is basically saying I'm buying the property as it sits today. I'm not going to ask the seller to make any changes or audit or modifications. I'm not going to ask them to fix anything in the property. We're buying it as is. If, if, you've negotiated with the seller and they've agreed to fix the foundation or they've agreed to do some kind of repair to the property, just put this next checkbox right here and put in what they've agreed to fix. I've never checked that box, just letting you know. All right, lender requires, there's no lender. We're not gonna worry about any of that. Number eight, this is only pertaining to if you are a licensed real estate agent in the state of Texas, really. Um, I've seen this filled out if you're a licensed agent in other states. Uh, say you have the license in California. I've seen them where they've actually gone through and uh, put that in here. But basically this is just saying that, you know, since you are a part of the transaction, if you have your license to sell real estate as a licensed real estate agent or a licensed real estate broker, you just have to disclose it. Not a big deal. The see here, it says buyer holds an active Texas real estate license, because I do hold an active license. I just put it right in here. Bippity boppity boo. Nothing else. Now, same thing goes for the seller. Let's say the seller, they also hold a license as well. If you have this information, just put it in here, buyer and seller both hold active real estate licenses. Simple. Don't overcomplicate it. If you don't know it, it's okay. How, how are you supposed to know? Right? How are you supposed to know? You don't know. So normally they will tell you and they just write it in there. Not a big deal. Closing. So this is where we're going to put in what day do we plan to close this property? Now, this is boxes designed to put an actual date like October 30th or whatever. I never put an actual date in there. And the reason why is what if I draft this offer today and then they don't sign it for two weeks? Okay, well, now they signed it two weeks later. My closing date's up in five days. I can't work with that. That doesn't make sense. So I always put a, a number of days from execution. So as soon as this contract is executed, now the timer starts. So if I send them this offer two weeks later, they finally decide to sign it. Now I, my counter starts from 21 days from that day. Now I may put 21 days, I may put 14 days, it all really depends on the contract. 21 days is kind of like my cap. 
Sometimes they want longer and we'll, we'll accommodate from them. Okay. Possession right here. Now this is going to be when will the buyer take possession of the property? When do I get the ownership of it? So most of the time it's going to be this first checkbox, which is upon closing and funding. So that's going to be as soon as we close on the property, money changes hands, we get the keys, we take possession. Where this will be different is say the seller has a lease back of the property or a carryover where after closing, they will still remain to live in the property for two weeks, a month, two months. There's going to be a time where they're basically renting the property back from you after they close. If you have that agreement, then you'll go ahead and check this box here that says according to temporary residential lease. So this is basically saying when are you going to take that possession? From everything I'm seeing here on the MLS listing, they're not requesting a lease back. So we're just going to go ahead and leave this at closing and funding. But that could change later and you just have to strike that out. If they need that lease back, again, going back here to Trek's website, that we have a seller's temporary lease, seller's temporary residential lease. You download that, fill it out. We'll go over that in another video. All right, special provisions. Now this is gonna be anything that needs to be added to the contract that's not part of the actual contract, right? So there's additional terms that you wanna add in here. So I use this as an opportunity to basically say that the buyer will pay all of the closing costs, right? Because it's not really stated in here that they will, but this is how I state that we'll, we're gonna pay all of the closing costs. So I say buyer to pay all standard closing costs except unpaid taxes, liens, judgments, and commissions. So basically saying that all of these other things, unpaid taxes, liens, judgments, and commissions, that's all on the seller. The seller's still responsible for those. We're gonna pay everything else though. Now, remember how I said earlier that there's a new disclosure you gotta put in effective January 1st? If you intend to assign the property you have to disclose to the seller that you may assign the property. So this is where so many people get so, oh my God, what's going to happen here? How are we, how are we still going to operate if we have to tell the seller that we are assigning this property? It's really easy. So all you need to do now, I'm going to disclose a disclaim here again. I am not a licensed attorney. I do not play one on TV or YouTube for that matter, but I am just a normal real estate agent. So I will recommend that anything that I state here, as far as legality wise, check with an attorney first. First and foremost, always check with an attorney. But in here, I will just state saying that seller grants the rights to the buyer to market the property prior to closing. So basically all is saying that the seller is, is giving us the ability to market this property before we actually close on it. Now I'm always going to let them know, Hey, look, Mr. Seller, as you know, I'm a real estate investor. We're intending to buy this property to make a profit. We may or may, we may close on this property, fix it up and resell it. We may close it, fix it up and rent it out or we may sell the property before we actually buy it. That's all we're gonna say, right? So we have multiple ways that we may close on this deal. Either way, our intention is to close on the property, but this is granting us the ability to market the property to other investors that we know who may be interested in the property. So that's all that's stating right there, that seller grants the right to the buyer to market the property prior to closing. Again, check with your own attorney to make sure that vernacular works for them and that we're good to go. All right. Settlements and other expenses. So this is basically saying, are there going to be other expenses or other settlement charges that the buyer or seller are agreeing to pay? I always put NA. I never put anything in here uh, because we don't intend to pay any additional amounts. But if you do agree to pay additional expenses, you just put that right here. All right, prorations, this is just basically, this is the big one that a lot of sellers get confused on when they get to closing because they'll say, hey, look, you made us an offer to buy this at 
but we see here on the closing statement that there's uh, tax prorations for 1300 bucks. Like, wait, what is this? Well, the taxes are calculated and paid at the end of the year, right? So if we're buying the property middle of the year, well, the seller is still responsible for the taxes from the beginning of the year until the day of closing of the property. So the title company will calculate the amount of taxes that should have been paid from the beginning of the year to that point in time of closing and create a credit back to the buyer for the buyer then use to pay the, to pay the full year's taxes at the end of the year because the buyer pays that at the end of the year. So just make sure you explain that to the, the seller that there will be a tax proration because they are responsible legally from the beginning of the year to the day of closing for the taxes. All right. And again, this is just more stuff that we can't change. Default, this is kind of the big one right here, basically saying that if either one of the parties default on their agreements of the contract, that they're found in default and that they, depending on which side, will get the earnest money. So let's say the seller doesn't comply with the contract after they've signed it, they decide they don't want to show up at closing, they decide afterwards that they don't want to sell the property to you or some other reason, then you can be found them in breach of contract or default of contract and you get all of your earnest money back. So you, you get your money back, you're good to go. Or if you're found in default, so you're past your termination period, you default on this contract, you, uh, the seller's obligation or sole obligation here is to retain the earnest money. That's what the earnest money is for. And then if there's any, any issues here, you got to use a mediator before going to court, you pay to, you know, agree to pay your own lawyer fees, et cetera, so forth. This is basic boring contract stuff. All right. Uh, escrow basically saying that we're going to use an escrow officer or escrow agent to uh, mitigate or the sell the property. Uh, there's no representations, federal tax requirements. Again, you can't change this whole page. You can't change anything on it. So it's like, it's good to, good to read it, to understand it, but you can't change anything on it. So you're not putting anything here. All right, notices. Now, this is a, a pretty cool page. So the notices are going to be, if there's any, uh, basically how do title or attorneys or anyone communicate with the buyer and seller? Right, so this page does have to be filled out. So I always just put my company information, I put our um, mailing address, my phone number, email address, right? So this is a, a business phone number, I'll probably blank it out. But this is how do they get a hold of me as a buyer? Now, this is where a lot of it goes wrong. It's this site here for the two seller. This is how do the how does the title company or anyone communicate with the seller? So the seller is supposed to fill this out. Most of the time, the seller doesn't fill this out. They, they, just, they overlook it. They're like, I don't want notices, right? So I've been told by an attorney that if the seller does not fill this out, that this is not an effective contract, right? So we've actually had to use this in the past where, uh, unfortunately, we had to terminate the contract uh, outside of our option period. And we went back to the contract and I pointed out, this wasn't filled out because the seller didn't fill it out and we were found in the right that we didn't have an effective contract so we got all of our money back so i don't encourage this obviously you want to give all the information you can to the seller but keep that in mind if this part is not filled out according to a texas attorney this is not an effective contract and the seller is not due any money all right agreement of parties this is going to be any additional addendums you know how through the contract we've had additional addendums that maybe we had to attach onto here. Anytime you have an additional addendum or any additional documents to the contract, you just have to check off the box to whatever you're attaching and then make sure that that way they know to expect that. So if there's a temporary seller lease, if there's a lead-based paint disclosure, if there's a buyer lease, if there's a backup con, whatever, you have to check the box. So in this case, this property is subject to lead-based paint. So we will check this box here for addendum for lead based paint, right? All right, consulting with attorney. This is only if you have an attorney, uh, basically saying that if there, if you have an attorney, anything that needs to go to an attorney should go here. You just put in your attorney's information. This part doesn't matter. I always leave this blank. Up to you though. 
if you want to put attorney information in there, go right ahead. All right, now we're at the last page. This is the beautiful part. You're almost done. Once all parties have signed, whoever is the last party of the contract to sign, which is typically the seller, but whoever is the last party to sign will execute the contract. So all they have to do, they sign, and then they put the date that they signed right here. This is now when the contract is executed or effective. So now your property, your contract is executed, your clock starts, your three days to deliver earnest and option starts, your 21 days or whatever those amount of days to close, that's when it starts. You are now under contract on this property and now you're ready to move forward. Now, this gets confused all the time too. Like I said, it's whenever the last party signs. So let's say you go through, you fill this out, you sign it, you send it over to the seller, but the seller goes through and they, they'll sign it, but they make a change. Maybe they go through and they change the amount of earnest money, or they go through and they change the price because they're countering it back to you. Well, they'll go through, they'll sign it, and then they'll put the executed date, but that contract's not executed because they made a change. It's not an effective contract yet because they made a change. Now they'll send it back to you. So now it's your duty to go through and say, yep, I agree to those changes. You sign off on those changes, you make an initial on them, and then you go and execute the contract. It's whoever is the last party to sign the contract. And again, I've had this. Again, I've had this where the seller will do that, fill it out, they'll execute it, and they'll send it back to me with a counter. And I'm like, no, we gotta blank out that execution because you need me to sign off on it. So watch out for that. And then this is where all parties sign. Now, typically it only gives you two lines because normally there's probably a max of two you know, a husband and a wife or whatever who's buying a house. Sometimes we've had it where there's like 10 signers. Basically, they just all sign on this page. So they may have to stack up, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter where they sign as long as they sign kind of in their column on this page. Same thing with the initials at the bottom of each page. They just kind of have this initial within that, in that area. Okay. Now this next page, this is going to be broker information. If the seller is represented by a broker, they're going to fill out the, the representing broker side. If you yourself are a licensed agent or you're a broker and you're looking to take a commission on the deal, then you're going to fill out this side. If you have a license, you already know how to take care of all this. If you don't have a license, you can ignore this entirely because it doesn't apply to you. But this is if you're looking to take a, a real estate commission on this. So I leave it as zero blank. I actually have these check boxes in DocuSign where if I check this box right here, now all these all these fields are active. But if I leave this check box unchecked, it's just it's blank because I'm not taking a commission for the most part. But let's let's just say on this one I'm gonna because it's on the MLS. So I'm gonna put that little box and then I got my three percent commission right there. All right, so this is the receipt page. You don't do anything with this page. You don't touch this. This is just, it's intentionally left blank. Uh, it does have the property address on here, but you send this to the title company and the title company will fill this out as they receive your option money, earnest money, contract. They'll fill all this out. Okay, now we get to the lead-based paint dis uh, disclosure. So again, I, I include this one on here because most of the time this is on almost every contract. Uh, again, it has to be here in order for it to be an effective contract, but this is really easy. This is basically just letting you know that you are aware that there may or may not be lead-based paint in the property since it's built before 1978. I don't really care, so again, we just put in the address. I always check this box here that says that I waive uh, the opportunity to conduct, to conduct a risk assessment because I don't care uh, at all. And I acknowledge that I received the information above that the seller is going to be sending to us. And that I've received the pamphlet to protect your family from lead-based paint. If you haven't looked at that, it's a really fun read. It's really not fun at all. Don't read it. It's really boring. It just lets you know about lead-based paint. But you just check the box and you've received it. And then you sign it. And that's it. That's how you fill out a contract. I know it was really fast. I know there's a lot of information there. So like I said, if there's stuff that you missed, Feel free to go back, rewind this video, rewatch it, and go back to any of the parts that you may have missed or didn't quite understand 
or reach out to me. Let me know if there's anything I can answer for you. I'd love to help you out to better understand this contract or any other forms of contracts. Uh, I do want to do other videos going over different addendums uh, to this contract, like the seller lease back information uh, or anything like that. I do want to go through that so you have a better understanding of some of those documents. But I just want to get this one out of the way for now. Um, again, since this is in DocuSign, I could just send it and sign it and send it on its way. I'm not going to do that for the case of this video. But I just want to go over how to fill out that contract. But once you sign it, you go ahead and send it over to the real estate agent or send it to the seller. Uh, if you have it in DocuSign or anything like it, like PandaSign or e -sign, any kind of e-signature system, you can send it to the seller to sign. But since I'm dealing with a real estate agent, I'm not going to send it to the real estate agent to sign through DocuSign. It kind of breaks it up from there. You just got to send them the actual document. Um, but yeah, so there, that is the quick and dirty of how to fill out a Texas real estate contract for wholesale properties. Now, again, this contract only applies to Texas. So if you're in other states, uh, this form may be similar, maybe a little bit different. Uh, most states kind of have their own forms for you to utilize. I always recommend finding their form and using that form. Uh, there are like three page contracts out there that people do have or they do use. I don't necessarily recommend them. Use them on a case by case basis, depending on who your seller is. If you're dealing with a real estate agent, you got to use the real estate forms. It's just, it makes life easier, right? If you're dealing with a direct seller, maybe a little old lady or someone who just doesn't want to deal with these big contracts and you're direct to seller, there's no real estate agents, maybe you could use one of those smaller forms just to make things a lot easier on them. But this is just going over the, the Trek form. I use this every day. I use it on every single transaction. People understand it and there's really never any kind of problems. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to help you out and I'll see you guys next time.